Hi, Lee. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm great. Happy Thanksgiving. Well, you're speaking uh, as a Canadian might speak. You're in Canada, right? Where it is Thanksgiving. It is Thanksgiving, and I am a dual citizen, so I, I enjoy both citizenships and both Thanksgivings. Well, that is incentive enough to become uh, a dual citizen, two Thanksgivings. Um, so let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. Uh, this is The Wright Show. You're Lee Smolin, well-known and very creative uh, physicist. Uh, you're at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics there in uh, Canada. Waterloo, Canada. Waterloo, Canada. In Waterloo. Waterloo. Known for both uh, Napoleon's famous loss and Blackberry's headquarters in, in, the, in, the, in the Canadian version. Exactly. Waterloo is to Toronto as Princeton is to New York. Okay. Well, now I'm in Princeton, so this is perfect. This is symmetry, as physicists say. Um, I know you have skepticism about certain forms of symmetry, but we, well, I doubt we'll get that. I doubt we'll get that far. We will get pretty far because uh, you've written this this uh, very weighty tone: the singular universe and the reality of time. Not your first book. Uh, this one is co-authored with the uh, Brazilian philosopher Roberto Unger. You yourself have written um, the Life of the Cosmos. The Trouble with Physics, and also a book called Time Reborn, which is a kind of a precursor to this, I guess. Yes, exactly. Uh, and speaks in particular to the reality of time part of this book. And why don't we start off there? I mean, this is, I should say at the outset, this is heavy stuff. I do not purport to be able to wrap my mind around this, but maybe by the end of the conversation, I will. So, for starters, you're saying that time is in some sense the most real thing there is? So what we mean is that time is fundamental. Many physicists and philosophers think that there is a level of description which is fundamental where time is absent, where the universe can be described in a way in which time plays no role. And this is the more mainstream. It's, it's difficult to appreciate but, and one of the things that we can do in this conversation is I can try to explain why such a crazy idea has become a mainstream viewpoint in contemporary theoretical physics and philosophy of physics. Now, is that, is, is that crazy idea related to the kind of Einsteinian idea that time should be thought of as a dimension that's not all that different from the three dimensions we're most familiar with? Is that where the... Yes, the, the, the way that some people would put it... Who, who consider themselves what we call block universists or eternalists, is that here and there is a matter of perspective, but reality, it's the same reality. Your perspective from Princeton, New Jersey, is a different perspective than my perspective from Toronto, Ontario, but they're all part of the same reality. And an eternalist would claim that now and then is also just different perspectives of one single timeless reality. As Einstein liked to say, there is no fundamental distinction between past, present, and future. It's all part of one timeless block universe. And what would you say is the distinction between past and future that these eternalists neglect? So the viewpoint that I was led to, and Roberto... Mange Unger, for different reasons, was led to, and then we de developed in the book together, is that no matter how far you down you go, there is a fundamental distinction. The present is real. What is real is the process by which the present moments are giving way each moment to the next moment to the next moment to the next moment. The future is yet to be real, is not real, and there are no facts of the matter about future events. Um, the past was real, is fixed. There are facts of the matter about it, but at the same time, is no longer real. Mm -hmm. So in a way, yours is the more commonsensical notion of the two, right? I mean, the, yours is the one that I think most people would find more intuitively. I think so, although there is a kind of paradoxical or contradictory motif, I think, deeply in our culture in which we look to things which are timeless as things to admire or to worship. We think that God is timeless. We, we, and I don't mean to have a theological discussion, but just culturally. We think that truth is outside of time. Many 
mathematicians and philosophers think that the truths of mathematics are beyond time, that mathematical objects like triangles and circles live in what they call a platonic reality, which is a timeless reality in which time plays no role, in which implications governed by logic rather than causation. Mm -hmm. And we should say, just by way of foreshadowing, that this your conception of time is related to your view uh, that the laws of the physical universe may actually change over time, which is, uh, and we'll get to that, but, but I should say that that's, that's one thing this is related to, right? Yes, Kosi, and that was how I got into it. For me, the path to this view came from first wondering, why are the laws of nature what they seem to be? rather than otherwise. Why isn't the electron twice as massive? Why doesn't it have a hundred times the charge it has? There's a host of questions you can ask about the fundamental particles and the fundamental laws. Why are they like this? And can we have an explanation within science? And to cut a whole logic of reasoning very short, I came to the view that the only scientific explanation for the choice of the laws of nature and the properties of the elementary particles is if they were the result of evolution over time, deep in our past, much of it before the Big Bang. And then there's a conundrum, because if the laws change and evolve in time, then you can no longer maintain the view that I was mentioning, that time emerges from timeless thought. From timeless thought, you said? Oh. So the view, the view, the Einsteinian view is that time is not fundamental. Time is an illusion, an emergent property, just like temperature is an emergent property. It's really the, the average energy of atoms in motion. Mm -hmm. Time is all, and so there's no temperature if you look at a small scale. There would be no time if you look at a fundamental scale. And time emerges from law, which is then timeless. But uh -huh. if laws evolve in time, there's a tension there. And it was really to break out of that tension that um, that we began the conversations that led to the collaboration with Roberto Manguevara Unger mm -hmm. and led to this book. And then Time Reborn, just to mention, came out first due to the peculiarities of different kinds of publishing, but was meant to be a popularization of this book with Roberto. Right. This is published by Cambridge University Press, an academic press, and so yeah. time, time Reborn is, is something we could also recommend our, our, our viewers take a look at then. You're, um, That's kind of you. Yeah. So, so then in this Einsteinian view, um, it's just uh, the fact that I'm here now is in some sense arbitrary. I mean, I, 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 I it, it, tell me this. I mean, we, we, we've seen, um, you know, there's this movie Interstellar came out in which there was time travel and stuff. Is like time travel more plausible in the Einsteinian universe where time is just like space. And I know that I have the potential to relocate myself in space is, is, is that, I, I don't want to spend very much time on time travel, but is that an idea that's more associated with, uh, the view you reject? But certainly the, the universe that was presented in Interstellar is one in which there is a higher viewpoint which he transcends to by going into the black hole, in which all moments are simultaneous or exist together. Um, I, I don't want to speculate about time travel. I think time travel is full of problems and contradictions no matter what your view of time is. Mm -hmm. the, the paradox of going back in time and murdering your grandparents and so forth. Right, right. Um, but um, there is, a, there is a, a fantasy side to the culture of contemporary science. You see this, I'm going to go out on a limb here, you see this in the fantasies about perfect artificial intelligence, the singularity where the computers take over. There is kind of boyish science fiction fantasy side that has taken over a lot of contemporary science and technology fantasy. And part of this is that time can be, it's all about, it, this is all religion and secret. It's all about transcendence, whether through the machine, whether through uplifting your mind and your soul into a machine, and transcending the barriers of time. It's all about transcending our natural existence. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So, so to get back about how, to how you were led to this, which may be a, a reasonable way to, uh, to try to wrap our mind around the idea 
itself of what it means for the time to be kind of the most fundamental thing in a sense. So in this Einsteinian view where uh, you've got, where time is just another dimension, hard for me to quite imagine since I, I can only imagine three dimensions in a very clear way, but that's the idea. And you're, and you're, you're saying this assumes that law is invariant wherever you move in space or in time. So it, so it assumes that physical laws, uh, if it's just this big four-dimensional grid, it assumes that physical laws don't change anywhere along that grid, which means they don't change over time. And you had reasons to think that physical laws may change over time. And I think you said you were led to this belief by virtue of pondering like, um, what, how the universe came to have so much complex stuff in it or what? That was part of it. Well, this, so the origin of this is, for me, goes back to the late 1980s. And there was a proposal for the unification of physics called string theory, which was new then. Mm -hmm. And string theory was believed to explain all the properties of the elementary particles by unifying them into one kind of object with the fundamental forces. And we don't need to get into how that was accomplished. Um, and at first, there was one unique kind of string theory, and it seemed like it was the answer to all our hopes. Um, because if there's one unique unification of physics, there's no choice in the creation of the universe, there's no choice in the laws. Um, then it turned out to be five different versions. Then there were hundreds of thousands of different versions. Then a friend of mine, Andrew Strominger, who's now a professor at Harvard, discovered that there were vastly more than that. And he wrote a paper in which he published the, the argument that there were vastly more string theories than that. And we were friends and had a conversation in which he said to me that the dream of deriving the properties of the elementary particles from string theory is dead because no matter what the experimentalists see in this vast number of versions of the theory, there will be some versions, in fact, there will be a vast number of versions which agree with the experimentalists. And then whatever they're going to see next will be versions which agree with that. So there's no, product, there's no predictive power. We can't sit on the theory and predict what the observers of the experimentalists will see next as we probe to shorter distances or higher energy. Right, and this right. was very disturbing to him. And it was disturbing to me. And I went away from that conversation pondering how is it to explain the choice which is made out of a vast number of other choices? And I was also interested in the origin of life. As an avocation, I was reading theoretical or evolutionary theory, people like Stephen Jay Gould, Lynn Margulis, Richard Dawkins, and so forth. And um, I was struck that there was a methodology in biology to explain how improbable choices which lead to a lot of complexity and structure get made. And so I said to myself, can I steal that method from biology and apply it to physics and cosmology? And I made a little scenario about how the universe could evolve and the laws could vary and be selected for those that, that produce the most baby universes. We, right. So, so, I mean, it's not just the universe that evolves, the universe changes in your view, but universes evolve. In other words, there's, the, your idea is, uh, I think, cosmological natural selection is the term, and the idea is that universes give birth to other universes through black holes, and if each universe, if there's some variation in the physical uh, properties or laws governing each universe, then it's analogous to natural selection, and you wind up getting a preponderance of universes whose properties are conducive to their own replication, right? Right, that's, that, that's basically it. So I wrote that down, I published it, um, I returned to it from time to time, it makes some genuine predictions, and two of those, which are the sharpest ones, have held up so far. And, um, but mostly I went back to my day job, which is working on the unification of general relativity or gravity and quantum theory, so-called quantum gravity. And in the quantum gravity world, we were dealing with a hypothetical version of the fundamental laws in which time is absent and time only emerges when you make an approximation to large scale, complex objects. And, um, and I contributed to this development. I, I found solutions to these timeless equations working with friends. I developed the 
the theory of these timeless equations, these timeless descriptions of quantum geometry. And then um, about eight years ago, I started a conversation at his invitation with Roberto Magdiber Anger. And in trying to talk through my point of view and my vision of physics, it became clear that there was a contradiction in my work. Because on the one hand, in the cosmological work, I was having laws evolve in time. I needed a notion of time that transcended any single version of the laws. And in my quantum gravity work, I was working with the with the standard viewpoint that time emerges from timeless law. And, um, you know, it's funny that you can live and work with a contradiction for years and only feel vaguely uncomfortable, and then you talk to a smart philosopher. And Roberto was very provocative and very right on. Mm -hmm. um, and it became clear that I had to resolve this contradiction in my work. And so... Much of that took place in a series of conversations and with Roberto in which we then planned the book and wrote this book together. Um, and some of it took place in collaboration with other friends and colleagues. Um, but I worked my way to a very different view in which time is, as we were saying, time is the most fundamental thing. Everything else may be emergent. Everything else may be approximate in terms of the method of description, but time goes all the way down, as we say. So, you, as, as you put it in the book, time does not emerge from space, although space may emerge from time. Now, that's something I think many people may join me in having trouble wrapping their minds around, the idea of space emerging from time. I, I guess you, you, you mean that ultimately in a kind of a mathematical, theoretical sense, in terms of, or... or or, or, is there, or, or is there a way that, it, that that actually is clear to you in a more intuitive way that maybe you could try to share with us? It's very intuitive. It's very intuitive. Um, quantum theories of gravity, and I'll mention a couple of them. One, loop quantum gravity. Which, which you're associated with and, and, de and developed. Um, spin foam models, which are a later version of that. Causal dynamical triangulations, quantum gravity causal set theory, there's a variety of different approaches. They all agree that the universe is more fundamentally described as a network. And just imagine the internet. Each computer is a node. They're connected to at servers, which are connected to other servers, which are connected to bigger servers, and so forth. So the whole thing is a network. And you could, you've probably seen pictures of this. You can graph, make a graphical representation of this network, nodes, our computers and lines between them are the connections between them. And what do those correspond to in the physical world in these quantum theories? I mean, what are the nodes? Like particles or what? Let me let me get to that. Okay. Um, now, the internet is in space. The nodes are computers which are at physical locations on the Earth. But it doesn't matter for the functioning of the internet. You could just imagine space goes away and just a network of connections remain. Now then you might imagine that space comes back as an emergent or approximate description in which, say, the distance in space between two nodes was related to the frequency of data transfer between them or signals transferred between them. And so space might arise as a dynamical manifestation of the underlying connectivity of the Internet. We're very quickly getting to a world in which the physical location doesn't... I mean, that's the goal of a lot of stuff going on in Silicon Valley is to make physical location irrelevant for our lives and the connectivity relevant. And as we move into virtual and mixed reality, this will become even more pronounced. Um, so the vision that we have for fundamental physics in these quantum theories of gravity is that fundamentally there's a network and if, in a minute, I'll explain why we're drawn so universally to this metaphor of a network. Um, and the network is fundamental, so it doesn't have, it's not particles. Sometimes we think of it as atoms of space, but they don't live in space, they make up space. So two nodes in the network, you can see as sort of atoms of space or little regions of space. Um, if they're connected directly, 
then we think of them as neighboring. They can transmit information most quickly between them because they're one step away. So we are used to describing a, a hypothetical version of reality in which there is no space fundamentally, there's just a network. Now, why is this a powerful metaphor? It is kind of the metaphor of our age. Social networks are built on this metaphor. I mean, why Facebook and LinkedIn and all that are free is that they're collecting data on our social networks. Mm -hmm. The social networks just seem to be a powerful way to organize information about us. Why? What is going on here? What's going on here, I think, is the triumph of a philosophy called relationalism in which what's fundamental are relationships which evolve dynamically over time. And this goes back to Leibniz more, I mean, other people, but essentially, especially Leibniz, the German philosopher, um, contemporary of Newton, a little bit older than Newton, if I remember right. Um, and Newton proposed a view of space in which space was absolute and fundamental. No matter what was going on, there would be space. Even if there was nothing in the universe, there would be space. We call that an absolute viewpoint of space. Leibniz countered with the relational viewpoint where what was fundamental was relationships between objects and events, mm -hmm. both for time. So time is just order or causation in a sequence of events. Mm -hmm. Without events, without change, there is no time. Space is just an order amongst the coexistence of objects. Um, and this Leibnizian or relational view was in the background for centuries, but with Einstein's general theory of relativity, with quantum theory, and ultimately now with quantum gravity, has triumphed over the Newtonian absolute view of space. And my pocket history of culture, that when we need a real historian to try to tie down, is that this is leaking into culture. And that's why we're so obsessed with networks, social networks, the internet, and so forth. It's all the same metaphor. Okay, so, so are you saying that the thing about a network is that you can come up with a complete description of its functioning without making reference to space, but you can't come up with a complete description of its functioning without making reference to time? Time is the events going on in the network. So the network changes dynamically, and that dynamical evolution of the network is time, and there is no more fundamental description than that. Right. You, 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 the most fundamental description is of events ordered in time, not events ordered in space. Yeah. So yeah. it's that, and you're saying already some of our physical theories really are network theories, so it makes sense that you would think of the physical world this way, it's in that sense that, that, that that's one sense in which the physical in the physical world time could be more fundamental than space. Yeah, although it's always important to make the caveat that we have interesting, plausible quantum theories of gravity, but none yet make experimental predictions that have been tested. So these are not on a level in which we could say we know that reality is like this. This is not like quantum mechanics or the theory of evolution or general relativity for which there's abundant evidence experimentally and they've been checked. Mm -hmm. This is hypothesis. This is, the, this is the frontier of theoretical physics now. But unfortunately, it's not yet checked experimentally. I, I always want to pose that because I think the public should understand the difference between science and progress and established science. So... Uh I guess if this turns out to be true, that notwithstanding how dominant space appears to us, it's not fundamental, and in some sense, may, I guess, may not even exist. I guess that, that would say something about the relationship of mind to the physical world or consciousness to the physical world. Or I mean, I know you touch on that a little in the book. You get into the question of consciousness, right? Is there a, is there a view implied here on that? Uh -huh. Let me back up and, and mention something else, and then I, I will very gingerly touch your question of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, we have evidence from quantum mechanics, very strong evidence, 
that there are correlations between distantly separated events that cannot be explained by information traveling through space to get there. You mean entanglement? Entanglement. So this is another motivation to think that space is not fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, now, in fact, there's recently some very interesting work from a variety of points of view that suggests that space arises from entanglement. Mm. So, um, now, consciousness, I, I, I'm i glad I said the thing about the difference between subtle science and science in progress. There's a third category, which is science of the future, which we can speculate about now, which we, they're real questions, they're proper scientific questions, but we don't have... They're not now on the frontier. We don't now have the toolbox to attack them. And consciousness is very much, in my view, in that category. So if I let myself put forward a few speculations about quality or consciousness, it's very tentatively. Um, it's much more tentative than anything else in these two books. But nonetheless, I did that... Um, by the way, the structure of the book with, with Roberto Unger, you didn't mention, but let me mention it. Right. It's interesting. It's actually four texts, a common introduction, Roberto's version of the argument, my version of the argument, and a section which describes our disagreements. And I can get into, if you want, why the book ended up in this form, but Roberto was very much against including any speculations about consciousness in the book. So let me... So, let so me blame him for whatever you're about to say. All right. Um, and I, I don't want to go into it much because it is very speculative. But um, one of the consequences of having laws evolve dynamically in time is that the future is open. This picture in which the future is determined from knowledge of the past or knowledge of the present so that there can be no hope, agency, will, aspirations, all these things are, we are told, illusions. We're all just computers going click, click, click. This, again, is the artificial intelligence mm -hmm. metaphor. Um, this gives a very different picture in which the future is unpredictable in small part. Most, much of it is predictable, of course, because much of science works, and the timescales over which laws evolve are very slow and very huge timescales. But nonetheless, the future is, in principle, open. And I looked in that area for a possible role for qualia, Qualia being the experience of seeing colors and so forth. Um, I basically take a point of view which is often by the philosophers attributed to Whitehead, I've learned, which is that there is a kind of outer set of properties that matter and events have, which are their properties which govern their relationship with other bits of matter and other events. And this is what physics and the laws of physics describe, these relational properties. You see this physics relationalism. Mm -hmm. But it could also be intrinsic properties of an atom or a rock or a amoeba or a brain, which are properties which are beyond the relational properties that physics describes. And Whitehead's move was to hypothesize that qualia are among those intrinsic qualities which are not relational and which are therefore private. That is, if you are a, a, a brain, you have access to your qualia, but you don't have access to any other qualia. This is also a viewpoint called uh, panpsychism in part. David Chalmers at NYU is a champion of it. He's a very interesting philosopher, I think. You're shaking your head. But. No, I, I just, I'm not sure he signed on to it wholeheartedly. You may be right. Another guy who's talked about it is Christoph Koch, uh, has talked about panpsychism. I'm sure Chalmers has at least flirted with it. 
Uh, but it is this this idea that 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 a like kind of a tiny bit of consciousness is inherent in even simple forms of matter, and then you get a bunch of them together, and you and you get you know you get complex physical systems such as our brains, and you get complex forms of consciousness. Yes, another philosopher who has gone who has considered these ideas is Galen Strawson, which I think is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, so I think flirt is the right word. I play with these views, I flirt with them. It's not an important part of my book. If somebody gave me a strong argument, I would back down right away. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I aspire, let me put it this way, I, it's one of the things I, I, I hope in the future to make a serious study of. But there are some suggestions which arose from the picture that we developed with Roberto. And being foolish, I put them in the book. Well, I think I, I commend you. I mean, I, I think consciousness is an underappreciated uh, problem by many scientists, and, and it's definitely a, a problem, something that has to ultimately be grappled with. And you're right, by virtue of it being, pri- it, because it's private, it's not amenable in a, to exactly the kind of scientific inquiry that the part of the world that's not private is. But anyway. But so. The view it fits into, if I can just bring this a little bit into the light, um, I considered a view which I call precedence. And by the way, this view, like the idea that laws evolve if they're going to be explained, had precedence in Charles Sanders Peirce's writing, which in each case I discovered after publishing them. Um, and and I'm very I find him difficult to read, but I find him an astoundingly interesting philosopher. The idea of precedence is that things don't obey regularities because there are laws which. Are, another mystery of nature is that there do seem to be regularities in nature. That's why physics is possible. The laws of physics, whether it's that objects accelerate with a constant acceleration, Galileo's law or the most sophisticated law of quantum field theory. These are regularities which are reproducible in experiments. Why is the world governed by regularities which are reproducible in experiments? The common view is that it's because there are timeless laws that make things happen, somehow reach in from the outside and make things happen in the universe. It will make things happen a billion years in the future, just as they did a billion years in the past because they're constituted outside time. And that's why there are regularities. So that view seems to me absurd because it requires things being outside the universe, uninfluenceable by processes or events in the universe affecting things that happen in the universe. And that kind of asymmetry I regard as as evidence of unscientific thinking. Um, So I tried to see if there was a way to understand those regularities that would be completely internal to the history of the universe, and came up with a hypothesis that maybe when you prepare a system in a particular situation, it has contact with past situations in which an atom or a system was prepared the same way, and picks randomly from past responses to that situation. to decide. So an atom faced with a particular potential, a particular experimental situation has access to the collection of similar situations in the past and chooses one randomly and reproduces it. Hmm. And that's why the probability distributions for outcomes of experiments are reproducible. But that idea has an interesting implication. I don't know if it's true. It's an example of an idea under which laws evolve and the future is open. What if you build in a laboratory an experiment which has no precedence, for which there is nothing to copy, well, then then the universe has somehow to make it up without precedence. And I suggest, and I'm looking into this with people who work with quantum computers, that we may be able to artificially engineer such situations and experimentally test this hypothesis But then it occurs to me that maybe this is what's happening in the brain, is that there's enough complexity that novel situations are being invented for neurons to respond to. And so neurons have to 
make it up, they can't follow precedent. And maybe that has something to do with qualia. That's the thought. So in, in that scenario, the, the kind of um, behavioral flexibility or open-endedness we associate with free will would actually be a manifestation of uh, properties of physical, of, of, of kind of the physics of which the brain is composed. I mean, it, it manifests that's, much more subtly in just inanimate atoms and stuff. That's the idea. And like any new idea, it's probably wrong. But an anecdotal experience that we've all had that suggested anecdotally is that we all know that we go unconscious when we're habitual. And consciousness is achieved by breaking out of habituation mm -hmm. and confronting either willfully or by force from the outside novel situations. It's only then that we really become self-conscious and mm -hmm. conscious of our situation. Okay. okay. So, th this, so your view is kind of that, I mean, first of all, like it's not enough to observe laws. We need to explain like where they came from. And, and this, this is one of the things that led you to this cosmological natural selection whereby uh, universes replicate themselves and you slowly get, as a result, universes uh, that are kind of rich in the sense of being conducive to their own development and subsequent replication. I mean, they at least have to get, if they're producing via black holes, they at least have to get to a point where they produce black holes and presumably the more the better and so on, right? So, Yes, and the hypothesis is that our universe has optimized, our universe is optimized for the production of black holes. And there's some evidence for this. We, it gets to be an interesting question in astrophysics to ask whether that's true or not. But I think there is evidence that it, that, that it is true. Um, the fact of the matter, whether these ideas are true or not, is that to a certain scale, we know the laws of physics. We know we don't have a complete description. We don't have a unification we know is right between the gravity part of the laws and the quantum part of the laws and the other forces. But the standard model of particle physics, which describes the laws in the absence of gravity, is verified over and over again. The real news with the Large Hadron Collider is not just the discovery of the Higgs, which was the last particle in the standard model to be predicted, but the fact that nothing else has been seen, which means the standard model triumphs. But the standard model is a very unlikely, complicated set of interactions with a lot of what we call fine-tuning, a lot of tuning of small parameters to tiny but very special values. Mm -hmm. And that's not explained by anything that we understand about the nature of the laws of physics or mathematical consistency. And therefore, to explain the special structure and the fine-tuning of the standard model, I believe we need a dynamical explanation. We need something happening in the history of the universe which selected the parameters to be what they are. And certainly um, most of my colleagues who think about these have uh, disagree about the kind of answers that they would propose. There are more people who think about eternal inflation than think about cosmological natural selection. But I think that a large number of working theorists now agree that the interesting question has become not just what the laws of nature are, but why these are particularly the laws of nature. And the failure of every unification we've devised, string theory, loop quantum gravity, etc., to give us a unique explanation for why the laws are what they are, underlies that an explanation in terms of principles won't work, and we need a dynamical explanation for what shows the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an, an analogy might be, you know, uh, when we look at Darwin looked at organisms and and said, well, they're they're so kind of complicated and in a sense fine tuned. There, there must be an explanation for how they don't just, you know, things like this don't just fall out of the trees like rocks or something. We need a special explanation. And you're saying the universe itself, when you observe it carefully, 
has properties that kind of in that sense demand an explanation. It's like things like this don't just fall out of the sky, so to speak. It, it, it's, it's more plausible that the universe would be structured this way if it were the result of a, a kind of a selectively creative process like, like natural selection. Yes, and if you ask, for example, you take something that we all take for granted, that there are a hundred or so different kinds of stable nuclei, including the things we're made out of, carbon and oxygen, and we just take that fact alone and consider what would happen if we changed the fundamental parameters, say the strengths of the three different forces that are involved, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and the electrical force, or it's changed the masses of the quarks or the electrons a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there are, within that small number of parameters, most of the ways, say, if you change, uh, increased any of those parameters by a factor of 10, you would end up in a world in which there were no stable nuclei. Mm -hmm. So our, in, in terms of, the, if you think of the universe or the laws as something like, a set of dials, say on an old-fashioned mixer, mm -hmm. where, you, where you might have several dozen dials to tune to do the levels of all the different inputs to your recording. There is a fine-tuning of all the different dials, which are in narrow ranges such that complex atoms and molecules exist. So that's, right there, that's one set of phenomena. You ask, why are there stable, long-lived stars? Stars are systems which are out of thermal equilibrium, and they maintain stable states of production of energy for billions of years. What would happen to the existence of stars if you started to mess with the tunings of the standard model? And most changes in the tunings of the standard model there would be to a universe without any stable, long-lived stars. Right. So... The, the complexity that we see in our universe at every scale from life and including life upward to the structures, the large scale structures in the galaxies, downward to the tremendous complexity of biological molecules, all of these are sitting on a knife's edge in terms of the fine tunings of the standard model. And that requires explanation and not just explanation, but if it's to be science, explanation that has testable consequences. Because if you have a scientific explanation, you have to be able to convince a skeptic that making a further prediction that is what we call falsifiable, that if the prediction went the other way, we would have reason to doubt the truth of our hypothesis. And to my knowledge, the only way to explain such fine-tuned complexity in a way that is falsifiable, that leads to testable predictions, is if there is an evolutionary process, a dynamical process, that chooses the laws to be what they are, analogous to natural selection. And Charles Sanders first knew that and wrote that very precedently in 1892-1893. And I think that the situation is, remains the same now. Okay, now, um, often when people note the so-called fine-tuning of the universe, they, they emphasize the connection to the existence of life, to our existence. They say, we would not be here if there weren't for this fine-tuning, and then they, they explore the, the philosophical implications of that. There's this anthropic principle discussion, and some people say, well, of course the universe is fine-tuned to permit the existence of life, because... If it weren't, we wouldn't be here to observe it, and maybe there's a billion universes out there where, that aren't, and we were lucky, and that's the end of the story. But l let me ask you um, a, a, a related question. Like, su suppose there are a lot of universes out there that are not just conducive to the creation of black holes, uh, but further uh, are conducive, as ours is, to the... Uh, evolution of actual life and even intelligent life. And suppose you're going to try to explain that. I mean, the, the, the temptation to, 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 of a way to integrate that into a, a cosmological natural selection would be to imagine a scenario where those universes where intelligent life evolves 
are more conducive to replication. In other words, like we like centuries, millennia from now, our progeny, there's this super intelligence that's so smart that it like figures out a way to create other universes or slip information. Like, is that my question is, is that impossible because, hey, you can't get information through a black hole or, or, or for some other reason? First of all, what is required of the universe to make many black holes is very akin to what's required for life. What you need to make many black holes is processes of cooling in dust-rich, gas-rich disks of galaxies, which lead to very massive stars, because it's only the stars on the more massive end that become supernovas, and that after the supernovas explode, become black holes. And the coolant turns out to be carbon monoxide, principally. So carbon and oxygen play an important role in producing a universe which has many massive stars in there for many black holes. So there's an interesting coincidence. And the fact is that the universe is full of carbon and oxygen. Carbon and oxygen are, apart from hydrogen and helium and so forth, the very light things, most abundant elements in the universe. So the universe is certainly tuned to make carbon and oxygen. And cosmological natural selection gives a consequence of that, which is for which the existence of life is irrelevant. Now, several of the arguments for the anthropic principle are really arguments about the abundance of carbon. For example, there's a famous argument which is quoted of Fred Hoyle, in which he argued that there had to be a fine-tuning in between two nuclear energy levels in order for carbon to be made plentifully in stars. Well, that's not a consequence of the anthropic principle. It's not a consequence of the existence of life. It's a consequence that the argument rests on not the existence of life or the fact that we making the argument are made of carbon. The argument rests on the observation that carbon is abundant, and the abundance, the abundancy of carbon requires an explanation in terms of the stellar production of the elements. So you don't have to mention life to make Coyle's argument. You just have to seek an explanation for the abundance of carbon. Mm -hmm. Now that's a non sequitur. Now, my basic response to the, but I, it gives me a framing for the question that you raised. So let me first of all mention that the question that you raised, I hope you don't mind, has been mentioned before and published. The idea that based on the scenario of cosmological natural selection, there might be civilizations in, made of intelligent living things in prior universes which somehow fine-tuned things to make the universe hospitable, to make future universes more hospitable to the nature of life. For example, just by making lots of black holes and therefore making the universes that were descended from theirs which had life abundant. This idea was published by Edward Harrison, who was a very distinguished cosmologist at the University of Massachusetts, and also by Lewis Crane, who's a very significant mathematician in the quantum gravity world. So the idea has been published. My own response to it is that we don't know enough. It's in the category. And, and here, this is really a question of strategy. Cosmological natural selection is an unlikely hypothesis. It might be true, as I said, it makes two predictions which so far hold up, but it's a strange idea, it's a novel idea, it therefore is an unlikely idea. Therefore, as it proponent, I don't think it's good strategy at the moment to append other equally or even more speculative ideas and collect them all together. It might be necessary in the future, but I'd rather postpone that conversation. And let me put it this way, if 50 years from now, 50 is a stand-in for any time after there's been significant progress. It continues to be the case that cosmological natural selection makes predictions which are held up experimentally, observationally. It continues to be the case that there are no alternative explanations. Mm -hmm. 
which explain what cosmological natural selection explains in a manner that's falsifiable. So there's much more confidence about the general tenets and also the assumptions that that black holes lead to baby universes, that there can be small changes in the parameters of the laws of physics. All these things are maybe supported by experiment. Maybe by now, by then, there are observations of predictions of the existence of, of, of bounces, we call it, going from a collapse to a black hole to the birth of a baby universe. Um, there could be some predictions from theories of that for the cosmological observations, the cosmic the fluctuations in the cosmological back, large-scale structure and microwave background. If we have much more confidence in the general idea of cosmological natural selection, then it might be appropriate and powerful to introduce ideas like what you're suggesting. But I'm afraid if I, as the proponent of it, now start to speculate about that, it's just going to weaken the case. Yeah, I, yes. I think that would be a, a bad public relations move on your part, so maybe I'll do it. But, but, the, um, but, but the one, I will say there is this appeal to it. You're right that it adds kind of complexity to the theory, which in itself is a, is a bad thing intellectually to add yet another convolution to the theoretical scenario. But on, in its favor is that, in a sense, it adds to the explanatory power of the theory in, in this sense. I mean... Natural selection is something whose kind of existence, I mean, we understand how it works, but kind of its existence is not really explained. And there are people um, who, th who think that actually natural selection was likely to create intelligence. There's a number of, of biologists who, who think that it has that tendency, and it's a pretty amazing machine for organic innovation, and of course it also leads to consciousness and so on. So natural selection is something that, although we understand and provides an explanation for life, that we don't have a clear explanation of like where it came from, what started, that where was the first seed of life, and so on. And in theory, this version of cosmological natural selection could explain that, is, is all I'd say on its behalf. But, but I, I take your point that you don't need to be in the business of adding uh, um, you know, convolutions to your theory. At the moment, um, I, I'm actually very interested in the origin of life, and I've worked a little bit on the origin of life. I have one paper on the origin of life. And I've been reading recently Ken Lane. I think that's his name. He's a biochemist at University College London who has a fascinating book on the origin of life. Um, he emphasizes the unlikelihood of the transition from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. This is a... And, and other people have emphasized this. The, the fact that a eukaryote are two prokaryotes in symbiosis, mm -hmm. Mar, the idea that Lynn Margolis established, um, is such an unlikely idea. And when you look at it, it's so, when you look at it in detail, it's so unlikely to succeed. Just mismatch between the, the genomes of the, what, the, the bacteria that become the mitochondria. <laughs> In, yeah, but we, we, we shouldn't turn this into a big argument about this, but, but it's something I've thought about and written about. And I would say that symbiosis is something natural selection has, has harnessed again and again, and the whole idea of like a non-zero-sum relationship between the genetic interests of two different entities. So in that sense, it's not surprising generically that symbiosis should show up again in the, in the evolution of the eukaryotic cell. But this is a whole... This is a whole Conversation. Let me. Um, you were, we're getting getting close to probably. Uh, well, go ahead. You want to say one more thing on that? Let me, let, let me use an analogy, so, and then we can go away from the origin of life, which is not my expertise. Um, there is no convincing. I'm not saying that it couldn't happen, but as far as I understand, there's no convincing scenario for the origin of life in the 3.8 billion years that we seem to have. To do. Let me start again. There's no convincing scenario for the origin of life in the 200 million years that there seems to be available for that to happen. So alternative explanations become attractive. For example, panspermia. Maybe there's an origin of life in giant molecular clouds, in cold, dusty, carbon-rich stellar environments. Um, the, if we fail to find the home or the origin point of life on the Earth, there are other 
options. And in a similar way, um, having something analogous to directed transpermia through the generations of, of universes in cosmology is an interesting idea. Um, maybe it's right. Um, I just... One, one thing that, that I think is, is, is good to think about is how much we don't know. I mean, mm. science progresses in 100 years or 500 years. We may very well be in the position to be working on a day-to-day -day basis in a powerful way with such ideas. Now it has to be on the edge of speculation. Okay. Kind of final question, or depending on how you want to address it, maybe a series of short questions. But the um, so back to this idea that time is fundamental. One way you put it is that there is um, in the book is that there is a priority of becoming over being. And and this you mentioned Alfred North Whitehead. This sounds a little like him. I think he said something like um, events are more fundamental than things, or something like that. And uh, another thing, and, and Whitehead, of course, uh, was not just philosophically, but theologically inclined. He had process theology. Another thing that some of this reminds me of is um, kind of Buddhism, at least in the sense of the kind of uh, Western Buddhism that some people have latched onto that puts so much emphasis on uh, m mindfulness and, and the idea that the only thing that's, that's that, that, you know, this moment is what there is right now. The past did happen, but it's gone. The future hasn't happened. Living in the moment and so on. I, I guess my question to you, I mean, you can respond to anything I've just said, but I'm wondering about whether for you, your worldview has either spiritual implications or to put it in more secular terms, kind of implications of, of applied philosophy. You know, if it in any sense might logically influence the way someone chooses to live their life. Wow. Um, let me take that in two parts, and you can choose what, what, you, what you want to use of this. Um, first, um, my, own, my own upbringing includes the fact that my parents were involved in the Gurdjieff work which is closely connected to both Sufism and Zen Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. And I don't practice any of those things as an adult, um, but it's possible that they, they played a role in my upbringing and my thinking. I, I, I'm happy to let other people think about that. As far as the implications for life, um, I tried in the epilogue of Time Reborn to suggest there are implications for how we understand our life and the challenges of life. Um, I could just point to them out of my personal experience. Um, I think seeing the future as at least a little bit open, rejecting the machine-like up AI viewpoint of nature in which everything is a machine and the future is determined and so forth. Um, these highlight to me the responsibilities and the opportunities of living in a world where time is real and the future is open. So they certainly going through this process had an effect on my own thinking about life. Um, you can also, I'll say two more things and then I'll shut up. Um, Roberto emphasizes that we should be careful about this kind of thinking because as he likes to say, even a universe which is open in the future is not friendly to us. We shouldn't think the universe is on our side. We shouldn't think the universe cares about the things that we value and we care about. Having said that, Roberto is the author of an approach to political philosophy and legal philosophy, which emphasizes the infinite openness of future opportunities. And I don't think that there's a coincidence with his interest in it. He wants a cosmology 
in which you can think of politics as continually open to revision, continually open to improvement. I'll mention the last thing. Um, I had a great privilege as a result of Time Reborn to be invited to collaborate with a playwright and a theater company producing a play which was about time in, in both its personal aspects and as a scientific idea. This is a play by Hannah Moskowitz, who is some people consider the upcoming young playwright in Canada and maybe North America. And she wrote a play, Infinity, which after reading Time Reborn, which captured the emotional experience of going through this transition from thinking that time is emergent and approximate and unnecessary to thinking that time is fundamental. In the life of one of her characters, who is a theoretical physicist, who does, in the course of the play, undergo this change in mind. And in the action of the play, she illustrates the issues and the consequences of this change of point of view. And I was tremendously floored and moved by having the opportunity of seeing this play in development. And indeed, it won the best new Canadian play last year. It is having a very good launch. And um, I think the, I, the, the, I'm, I'm, I tried, as I said, to express some of these thoughts in Time of One, but collaborating with an artist who is a really a good artist on expressing these issues was a great privilege. And I think she did it much better than I did it. Okay. okay. And what's the name of that play again? Infinity. Infinity. Okay. Uh, well, we commend that to people. And also, your co-authored book, The Singular Universe and the Reality of Time, but maybe for some readers, they might be uh, have an easier time starting off with your book, Time Reborn, it sounds like. That was actually a trade book written for a popular audience. Uh, trade, time Reborn is a trade book. Um, they're very different. Um, I, I have had people report to me that they have different reactions to both. Some lay people prefer Time Reborn. It does attempt to craft particularly an introduction into why physicists came to believe that time is inessential, um, which we assume is the starting point of the singular universe. But there are lay people who have gone right to the singular universe and plunged in um, Roberto's style is very different from my style, so you have the very interesting thing of the two different styles next to each other like that. Um, uh, Roberto's style is more uncompromising, more provocative than mine. That appeals to some people. Um, Roberto's response to my writing is always, what do you think you're trying to do? You don't make friends with your audience. You don't be nice to your audience, you just lay it out <laughs> uncompromisingly and your audience will come. Um, so I think the two books are very different um, and they're different. I would suggest somebody interested in these ideas look at both of them and decide which one talks to them better. Okay. okay. Well, then we encourage Let's... that. And, and thanks again for uh, taking the time, Lee. I really appreciate this and, and hope... Uh, Hope we can have a conversation down the, down the road. There's a lot we haven't talked about yet. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care.